Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Southeast Collaborative Online Conference. My name is Dorcas Davis. I am the Director of Continuing Education and Training for the Georgia Public Library Service, and I'll be your host for this session. And also on tech support, we have Continuing Education Consultant Cindy Church from the State Library of Virginia. So please, if you have any technical issues, please um, message Ms. Cindy Church. Um, today, we will focus on the necessity strategies and benefits for library staff to develop relationships with customers in their community from our keynote speaker, Brian Hart. This event is supported through funding from the Library Services and Technology Act through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Before we get started, I do have a few things to share with you. This session will be recorded and archived. A link will be emailed next week with access to the archived session. If there are other people watching this webinar with you, we'd love to hear about it so that we can have an accurate headcount for our records. So please send an email um, to one of us <clears throat> and let us know um, who's watching with you. Also, you will have an opportunity to, to submit text questions for our presenter. Just type them in the chat area. You will receive CEUs for this session and the other sessions included in the Southeast Collaborative Online Conference. And lastly, please look for the survey link in your inbox. That survey will allow us to um, justify continuing to have the Southeast Collaborative Conference. And now I'd like to introduce the co-founder of AOA's Librarians Build Communities, and 2018 ALA Leadership Institute participant, Brian Hart. Thanks for being with us, Brian. Thank you for having me. Uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come and share on, on this subject of uh, nurturing relationships. Um, I, uh, by nature, am very relational. And so um, I'm a little um, uh, sad in that I can't be in the room uh, and, this, and that we can't share the same space, um, but I do appreciate that in this uh, very connected uh, age and society in which we live that we have this opportunity. And so I want to thank uh, the members uh, of the team who have put this conference together, uh, particularly uh, uh, Lauren Closley of the State Library here in North Carolina, Cindy Church of uh, the Library of Virginia, Dorcas Davis, uh, and Tiffany Hayes. I appreciate um, your efforts uh, and the invite. And so um, again, as I stated, uh, I am really passionate about nurturing relationships. Um, I think it is uh, core and essential uh, for providing good customer service uh, and good quality experiences within our library spaces. Um, and so I am uh, very honored to be able to have this opportunity to share with you on this subject. So uh, just a tad bit more about me. Uh, I am the deputy director for the Greensboro Public Library. Um, I was a 2014 ALA Emerging Leader and 2018 ALA uh, Leadership Institute participant. Uh, additionally, I do serve on the uh, executive board for every library, uh, as well as being uh, on the North Carolina Public Library Certification Commission. Um, what I am most um, uh, proud of is my, my time as a youth services uh, librarian. Um, because that uh, is one of the few positions in libraries that allows you to interact with the entire family as opposed to just one uh, demographic. Um, what you see here, uh, this picture, uh, is m me and some of the colleagues, uh, some of my colleagues at the Greensboro Public Library. Um, because we place such a heavy emphasis on uh, nurturing relationships, both internally and externally, um, back in 2018, we established uh, branch tours uh, where we take all new employees out to the branches to meet their colleagues um, and to learn more about uh, the library, uh, both the history um, and the direction in which we're going. Um, and it is a way for them to begin to network so that they understand that, uh, one, they're a part of an entire system, um, and two, uh, so that they are able to kind of, you know, broaden their network um, and, and meet the people whom uh, you know, they'll be leaning on and, and, and serving uh, the community alongside of. So um, just thought I would explain that picture. 
So for today's agenda, um, as the title suggests, uh, we are talking about nurturing relationships to cultivate resilience. And so uh, we'll briefly kind of explore and define what resilience uh, means, um, at least some of the, the, the definitions and, and um, you know, that kind of rise to the top for me uh, and their relevance in uh, libraries, particularly public libraries, since the bulk of my experiences uh, have occurred there. Uh, then we'll talk about relationships and opportunities um, and how it is really essential to um, not be risk adverse. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, and how being risk adverse still um, requires you to exercise responsibility and, and to be accountable um, to those whom you're serving. Uh, and then we'll talk about some engagement uh, opportunities. This is kind of the portion in which I kind of delve into, or which we'll delve into the different strategies. Um, and because I tend to be, um, you know, very high on, on sharing experiences and, and hoping that people can glean different techniques and, and information from those experiences, we will specifically be exploring uh, some of the different programs and engagement opportunities that I've uh, been uh, blessed to be a part of. So resilience and its relevance to libraries. So resilience, uh, according to the American Psychological Association, um, is adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, and significant sources of stress. Like building a muscle, it takes time and intentionality, focusing on connection, wellness, healthy thinking, and meaning. Um, and for me, this particular definition resonates a lot with me uh, when you talk about trauma in its various forms. Uh, recently, uh, last week, in fact, I had the opportunity to attend uh, the Public Library Association's conference and specifically went to a pre-conference pre uh, which focused on trauma-informed uh, approach or approaches to library service. And one of the things that was eye-opening for me was the various forms uh, that trauma, um, you know, can, can exist or take on. And uh, what might be traumatic for one might not necessarily be traumatic for another. And so when you talk about resilience, um, you know, being able to uh, emerge uh, from trauma, being able to uh, leverage uh, things that you learn um, in the aftermath of a traumatic experience, uh, you know, and put them to use, put those things, those concepts to use uh, in a meaningful way, not only for your uh, you know, advancement, but for the advancement of others is really uh, what it, what resilience means for me. And so that's one reason in which I chose this definition. Um, also, because uh, I'm citing uh, using the APA format, I thought it was uh, <laughs> uh, important that I give a nod to APA for their definition of resilience. Uh, similarly, another definition of, of resilience that resonates with me uh, is that it is a concept, or uh, the concept of community resilience, rather, uh, which is um, very much so about building local capacity um, through pooling resources from various agencies together. Um, and again, even in this variation or form of resilience, you'll see um, how trauma is highlighted, um, not in a, um, you know, not necessarily to glorify it, but to have a full understanding of uh, and scope of what trauma can be, both for individuals, for communities, and even for organizations. Um, when our library um, adopted or, or, or began uh, conducting those library tours that I referenced a moment ago for new staff, that in and of itself was a change. Um, and in many times uh, when you're ushering in change, um, be it something that on the surface is you know, completely positive, you don't wanna underestimate the fact that it could be uh, somewhat or slightly traumatic um, or challenging for, for others to, to, to buy into. And so therein lies, um, you know, kind of a bit of trauma in and of itself. So um, we focus here at the Greensboro Public Library on, you know, creating a resilient culture within um, so that we can support the community, uh, the external community that we serve. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we progress through uh, this presentation. <clears throat> in terms of, uh, or in addition to, to what I've shared thus far, uh, resiliency in libraries um, also speaks to the uh, trust, the affinity that people uh, and, and communities and organizations have for our institutions and by extension for our staff. 
Um, you may recall uh, an article uh, written by uh, Eric Klinenberg um, back in 2018, which was uh, titled To Restore Civil Society, Start With the Library. And I think one of these quotes that I gleaned or pulled from uh, that article, I think also speaks to uh, the importance of, of libraries in helping to build uh, resiliency within their communities. And so I wanted to share these definitions kind of as a, to, as a tone setter for why uh, nurturing relationships is incredibly important and what that looks like uh, within a library setting and what our responsibilities uh, to the community are as we uh, move in that direction of helping uh, both individuals and communities become more resilient. So for me, uh, being very relation, relational uh, in, in my nature, um, both personally and professionally, um, I value perception. Um, and I know that sometimes they, you know, we're, we're advised to not necessarily um, internalize or, um, or prioritize people's perceptions of us. Um, but I, I think it is highly important to, um, to understand what people uh, perceive um, so that you can best serve them, particularly uh, from a professional standpoint and within our, our industry uh, of, of public libraries. And so um, that's kind of what I wanted to want to begin this discussion or this part of this discussion about relationships on is sharing this uh, data, which comes to us from uh, the Pew Research Center, the study that they did uh, back in 2016, where they uh, surveyed uh, voters, surveyed library users, um, and here we see some of the public perceptions that people have regarding libraries and, again, by extension, librarians. And so at this point, uh, because I want this to be um, as um, participatory as, as, as possible, I'll ask, is there anything on this particular uh, slide that stands out or speaks to um, any of you all listening in. And Dorcas, if you're able to uh, share any comments or, or feed forward that people are sharing in the comments, I'd appreciate that. Sure. Beth Daniel said, right now, the health, health information, um, I'm not seeing any other comments besides mm -hmm. that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is uh, certainly uh, a really important part of what we um, as libraries um, are doing for our communities. And so I appreciate you you sharing those thoughts. Um, and according to this slide and according to the, the study that the Pew Research Center, Research Center conducted, you can see that um, a little over 70% of those surveyed or polled um, believe that the library is um, supportive in helping people uh, seek health and, and verify health information um, that they receive. And so I think that the attitudes regarding libraries and library staff are um, pretty high. And so we have that affinity. And I think because of that, we can, as I stated early, earlier, be um, comfortable taking some risk and leveraging that affinity that uh, the community and that individual users have for us um, so that we can build uh, healthy relationships with them, learn more about them, and be more intentional uh, in our service to them. In my work with uh, every library, um, which I won't delve into uh, specifics of that organization, um, but what I will say is that in, our, in, in, in my work with that organization, I've had the opportunity to provide um, some very strategic and tactical support to uh, libraries who are, um, or library yes committees, if you will, who form around uh, different ballot initiatives. I'm able to go in as are uh, my colleagues in that organization, able to go in and provide some real advice to them on how they can best leverage that affinity and that um, you know positive rapport that the library has with the community for the benefit of, um, of those ballots or those bonds being passed. And I think that these approaches are uh, relevant even in other instances, right? It just doesn't have to, it's not exclusively applicable um, to, you know, 
bonds and, and referendums and the political, uh, you know, pursuit of, of funding, um, but also just in, you know, support for our programs and, and, and getting, you know, uh, people are raising awareness about the different services uh, and resources that the library uh, offers to the community. And so one of the things that we uh, emphasize is how candidates, um, you know, really uh, communicate and, and, and talk specifically to their uh, constituents. And so when they run for office, they're very cognizant of the fact that attitudes regarding them, regarding their party, regarding their, um, you know, their preferences, uh, how, how those impact um, you know, the voters and, and, and their hopes for, you know, being elected. They write and they repeatedly share their stories. Um, it, it, it is not uncommon for, you know, literature uh, to surface ar around candidates, by candidates, um, when they are, are doing, uh, when they have, you know, candidacies or, or elections or things that they're pursuing. And similarly, I think libraries have opportunities to uh, be very vocal about their strategic plans or roadmaps or even their uh, magazines that, that um, highlight the different services and programs and offerings that they uh, provide to the community. And so uh, I think it is important that we use those, uh, those, those tools uh, that we create. It's not uh, enough for those uh, materials to, to sit um, in our uh, facilities, we need to be, you know, adamant about taking them out into the community and sharing the stories with people uh, in the various pockets in which they live and, and exist. <clears throat> Another uh, real key aspect of, um, you know, engendering support um, and, and, and nurturing relationships is to um, identify shared values and, and goals and aspirations, both with individuals and organizations. Uh, this is uh, fundamental for establishing coalitions and partnerships. And so often when we talk about partnerships and coalition, coalitions, we're, we're thinking of, um, you know, one organization aligning with another. One of the things that I appreciated uh, about joining the Greensboro Public Library System in this capacity when I did uh, just about three years ago was that its mission statement emphasized that we uh, were in partnership with the community, um, you know, not just in partnership with a particular agency, um, but we were in partnership with the community. And so uh, the individuals, uh, particular neighborhoods, um, other groups and agencies, and even other city departments, we are in partnership with them all in order to provide the free and equal access to information to foster lifelong learning um, and to inspire the joys of reading. And so in that, um, because that, uh, governs all of our actions, it helps us uh, to build capacity uh, because we don't uh, assume the onus of moving our community um, or our users forward alone. You know, we, we share um, in that responsibility with the users themselves, obviously, and, and, and also the other like-minded organizations um, and, and departments that exist with, uh, in the city of Greensboro. Uh, one strategy that I'll share uh, from this slide or highlight from this slide is to engineer small victories early in the process of collaboration and, and forming um, uh, coalitions. And what I mean by engineering small victories is, you know, oftentimes there's low hanging fruit um, and, and it's okay <laughs> to go for that low hanging fruit so that you can begin to establish working relationships with, um, you know, with community members, with organizations, um, kind of an applicable, um, you know, personal uh, anecdote, uh, when, when my wife and I formed our coalition <laughs> and were married uh, back in 2006, my uh, father-in-law said, celebrate the small uh, victories and, and successes uh, because he knew, you know, that there would be challenges um, that, that would arise uh, along the way. And, and so similarly, when applied to a professional context, I think it's important to not only engineer those small victories and go for that low-hanging fruit uh, at the, in the early phases of, of uh, creating a coalition or relationship uh, with an individual or an organization, but it's also equally important to celebrate uh, and acknowledge um, those victories as they occur. When speaking about partnering with particular individuals, one of the things that um, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight is kind of the art or, or nature of power mapping, um, which is something that, again, 
uh, through the work with every library, uh, you know, we, we talk quite a, extensively about with those groups whom we are advising or, or providing that support for. Um, and power mapping is essentially, you know, being able to identify um, a target or, or, or influencers within your um, network, within your existing network or families even, um, and being able to, you know, speak the language uh, or, or tell the story of the library uh, using the language that, that resonates most um, with those individuals or those groups. Um, when you are going for the low hanging fruit or if you're going for um, big, bigger projects and goals, it's important to not be afraid to leverage your networks. Uh, just like we spoke about leveraging the, the positive rapport and affinity that uh, libraries have in the community. Individually, we also have relationships. Um, you know, we have familial ties, we have friendships. Uh, we are a part of, you know, social uh, groups and, and, and affiliations. And so it is okay to give ourselves license to leverage those networks um, for, for the good of, of the library to help move um, or advance um, projects and issues along. On this slide, uh, because uh, in our profession, we, uh, and I in particular, I'm gonna own it, uh, really like acronyms. Um, I think that one of the benefits of engaging uh, and forming partnerships with uh, others is that we extend our reach. And, um, and so obviously you see that acronym, you can borrow that. Uh, I don't even need credit for it. <laughs> um, I imagine everyone's in their respective spaces laughing at that, but if not, I'm a proceed anywho. Um, and so, but I think this is important, uh, particularly, well, I won't read it all since it's there, obviously. What I will share is that I think the humility uh, part is, is, is the key component of extending our reach because uh, what you can't um, grow, you can't uh, fix uh, anything that you can't acknowledge, um, you know, as being wrong or as being, um, you know, an opportunity even. Um, and so having that humility and awareness, um, you know, and being able to, uh, you know, be willing to learn and, and glean from others, grow from experiences is a key component um, of, 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 you know, developing partnerships, working with others, uh, because if you can't, you know, say, hey, I'm, I'm deficient in this particular area and I need to align with um, you know, the, the housing authority in order to best serve, um, you know, those that are housing insecure or, um, or, or temporarily, you know, experiencing various forms of homelessness. Um, you know, if you can't acknowledge that one, that's an opportunity and one, you as a, as a library or as another agency aren't equipped to do that alone, um, then you can't grow. And, and, you know, the end user or the person who you could assist um, you know, suffers ultimately. And so in that vein, uh, what I uh, appreciate is this, um, you know, this, this philosophy of Ubuntu is, which is I am uh, because we are, or I am what I am because of who we all are. There's various variations of it. Um, this is kind of a condensed uh, interpretation, but I think that is, is important um, to remain cognizant of that we are um, who we are as individuals, um, because of, you know, who we are as a entire neighborhood, entire society. Um, and so what you see here on this, uh, in addition to the power mapping um, kind of uh, a demo, uh, graphic is me uh, at a, um, in a community doing some outreach um, in, in an initiative or, or program uh, that was titled Bus Stop Bookshare uh, that I was able to uh, work with uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools while I was employed with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. Um, and I'll explore that and talk a little bit more in depth about that um, towards the end of this presentation. Are there any questions thus far? Um, I'm comfortable pausing here for a moment to, to address anything, uh, if there are any. Okay. <clears throat> so earlier, uh, I spoke about taking risk. Um, there is a TED talk um, 
by Adam Grant, uh, which I believe is titled The Surprising Habits of Original Thinkers. Um, and within that uh, TED Talk, um, he speaks about embracing failure and having lots of bad ideas. Uh, so I encourage you to, to, to visit that, to cue that up um, if you um, have not had the opportunity to do so. Um, having lots of bad ideas is an important piece of developing relationships um, and, and, you know, becoming more resilient, right? Um, because you learn from those instances. Um, and I hesitate to call them mistakes um, because, you know, if you can glean something from them, then, you know, it, then it was intended to happen in that way. And so therefore, in my opinion, it's, and in my estim estimation, it's not necessarily a mistake if you've gotten something positive that can help uh, move you uh, in the right direction to crafting that, that idea that does have sticking or staying power. And uh, another uh, sentiment or quote um, that I really appreciate is that, that, that encourages risk taking is that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read uh, and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I think that um, kind of underscores the, um, you know, kind of the resilient, uh, the resiliency that we talked about thus far. Um, it, it, there's an elasticity, if you will, to um, serving the community, uh, to being able to, you know, experience things, learn uh, from trials and, and, and errors, and, and to be able to emerge um, with greater capacity um, and, and, and better from having had the experiences. And so uh, one thing that I, one kind of philosophy that I personally have developed over the uh, course of my, my professional career in libraries um, or paraprofessional career in libraries um, was to become comfortable uh, taking risk while being mindful to not go rogue. Um, because that's certainly not what I'm advocating for is to go rogue. I think you have to take calculated risk, um, and I think you have to be, uh, you know, mindful of, of, you know, priorities within an organization. Uh, you have to be mindful of those shared values when you start to form relationships or coalitions. Um, you have to be mindful of the synergy um, so that you can avoid mission drift and so that you don't go off course. Um, and so I just think that's an important little anecdote and wanted to, you know, use this opportunity to pass that along to whomever may benefit from it. <clears throat> In the same vein, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I, I put our, the Greensboro Public Library's mission uh, up here um, just because I, I think that, you know, it's probably not dissimilar um, or too foreign um, from some of the mission statements from your organizations but I also put it up here because if you aren't familiar with your organization's mission statement and values, um, I encourage you to, to really become, you know, very familiar with them and to be able to, you know, recite them um, or cite them to others because um, in addition to helping to keep you from going rogue, um, it is also a part of your story, as we, you know, stated earlier, right? Sharing your story, uh, you know, with others um, helps to engender um, good vibes uh, and increase that affinity and, and positive relationship that they have uh, with with you or you know as a library or as library staff and so um, communicating your your mission to them um, is an important piece of that they know where you, where you stand and, and what your purpose is within the community uh, you're serving together um, the other thing that is uh, prominent on this screen uh, is our libraries uh, customer service philosophy. And because we're going to transition here in a moment to talking about various forms of engagement and customer service, I wanted to you know, kind of pause here and, and highlight this. And so uh, beyond customer services, our library's branded customer service philosophy, uh, it is too an acronym. Um, I don't, there's no shame in my, in my uh, appreciation for, for acronyms. And, and so anywho, <laughs> Uh, the B in this stands for be proactive, the E is for engaging, the Y is learning to make a difference, O, owning your actions, uh, N, nurturing the relationships, and D, uh, delivering quality experiences. I won't necessarily read uh, a lot of the fine, finer print there, um, but if anyone is interested in, uh, you know, in receiving this, I'm happy to share with you. If you'll, you know, email me, I'll share my email address at the conclusion of this. But essentially, why we felt it was necessary to develop this um, is because we did want to 
uh, reinforce for um, you know our team here at the Greensboro Public Library the necessity for them to nurture uh, relationships and to actively seek to make connections with our customers um, and and colleagues uh, you know here um, and within our organization. And so we also wanted to uh, in, in doing this we wanted to really drive home the point that the reason why it is so important to nurture relationships within our industry, within our profession and libraries is because, you know, while we talk so much about customer service and even I have, you know, used that phrase uh, within this presentation, what we do is really public service. What we do is really public service. And so uh, contrary to what this might suggest, I'm not, and we are not, um, you know, encouraging people to go up beyond or above and beyond, you know, what their job descriptions or the call of duty is. But what we are uh, wanting to reinforce is that what we do is beyond customer services, public service, the stakes are higher. Um, and so we need to be aiming and striving towards superior stakeholder service, if you will. And, you know, and, and by that, uh, I'll use this example, you know, people applaud and, you know, laud and they really, um, appreciate the, the experiences or customer service um, interactions that they have at places like Chick-fil-A, just as an example. Um, but Chick-fil-A, um, I am not, I don't have an expectation for Chick-fil-A um, or Target or any of these other organizations that um, champion their customer service uh, models. I don't have an expectation for them to know me uh, personally. I don't have an expectation for them to, uh, you know, uh, uh, know my story or to tailor um, their, you know, their menu or their services or products uh, to meet my needs. Uh, but there is an expectation for those that enter our public libraries and even academic libraries, there's an expectation for people uh, or from people uh, that we as library staff, the paraprofessional or professional, for us to know who they are um, and for us to be comfortable getting to know them. Um, you know, and, and so we need to embrace that, not run from it. We need to embrace it and see it as the opportunity that it is to be more um, intentional about our service to them uh, in terms of tailoring um, services to them, getting to know them personally and allowing their preferences and interests and needs uh, more so to, to influence the direction um, in which we go. So, um, any questions at this time? Hi, Brian. There are a few questions. Okay. One question is, what's an example of a bad idea you had? Oh, that's a good question. Um, a, a bad idea I had. Um, so, it's interesting because we're going to progress into, um, you know, this, this part of the uh, – presentation where I explore some examples of things that I've been involved in. And actually one of them in particular, um, while the best intentions, I don't necessarily know that execution uh, was the greatest. Um, and so um, it was uh, a program called Read Between the Rhymes uh, that I started, um, had the opportunity to start uh, while employed with the Richland uh, public or what is now Richland Library in Columbia, South Carolina. And um, while, again, the best intentions, I think it was a, somewhat of a bad idea um, in that it was not sustainable because the model that we were using, we were using this as an online book club um, to get teens to uh, connect uh, and, and, and interact with the library in a, in a different way. And so we um, had a relationship with a local radio station and we uh, asked, um, approached them about the possibility of them using um, uh, or, or supporting the program by recording public service announcements um, uh, that would you know, promote not only the library, but the book of the month that we chose. And so um, I say this was a, somewhat of a bad idea because, um, you know, it was the way in which I went about co making those connections and relationships happen. Um, I overstepped in some ways, and I'm comfortable saying this now because that experience is actually what 
led to me developing that kind of mantra and approach of taking risks without going rogue. Um, and so I'm going to progress through the slide so that I can uh, kind of explain that um, experience a little bit more in depth. But are there any other questions before I do that? And thank you for that one. Yes. Um, do you have a problem with staff enabling patrons and doing for patrons rather than guiding them and teaching them how to do for themselves? Um, how do you discourage enabling? Yeah, I think um, it is a fine line. Um, one of the things that, um, and I'll, I'll give credit to uh, our library director for this um, because she and I've had many conversations about this, but one of the things that we have to be cognizant of is our limitations, right? As I said a moment ago, um, if you're not aware of a deficit or, or the limitations that you have, then you can't really go and, and as a um, result, you're, you're going to, you know, hurt, um, you know, those, the end users. And, and so one of the things that we talk about is how, you know, we can, uh, for lack of a better phrase or term, we can kind of lead them to water if they want to learn about, um, you know, computers and coding, um, if they want to learn about uh, English literature, if they want to explore uh, various time periods in history, we can certainly uh, connect them and, and share with them various materials and resources and programs that, that we have, uh, you know, that can get them there. However, um, or can, excuse me, can introduce those topics and subjects to them. Um, however, if they want to go further and become, um, you know, a computer engineer <laughs> or, uh, or if they want to become a historian, um, then they're going to have to take it upon themselves. They being the community is going to have to take it upon themselves to go that extra step and, and get the certifications or the, degree, or the degrees that will enable them uh, or position them to be able to accomplish their goals. And so as far as, uh, you know, how we kind of help to steer or set up guardrails to keep staff from doing that is we just, we say that we give them, uh, we encourage them to, you know, to, to, to take the lead and to, to be proactive in their service, but we also remind them of the guardrails and the limitations. Um, and, and, you know, not just, you know, the, the limitations in terms of, you know, legal considerations, for instance, if somebody's using the computers to enter a, a computer form that's going to require them to put in their social security number, that's that's obviously a limitation that they're very comfortable adhering to. But even those other instances in which they themselves want to push forward, um, you know, we are very intentional about speaking to them about, hey, you know, we can lead them to water and we have the resources and the the um, the, the knowledge, if you will, to, to be able to do that, um, the skill sets to be able to do that. Um, but we have to allow them um, as a as customers and, and users to to go the rest of the way and to be comfortable going the rest of the way. Um, so I hope that kind of addresses and answers that uh, question. So engagement in any environment. Um, as I said, during this portion, I just want to really highlight some of the different um, programs and, and then we can you know, revisit any questions that exist. But I wanted to highlight some of the programs and engagement opportunities that um, through uh, the formation or development of relationships, um, nurturing of relationships with both individuals uh, and organizations, uh, we as the library um, have been able to, you know, create a more resilient uh, community and and help people themselves become a bit more resilient in dealing with the things that life is throwing their way. And so the first uh, example that I want to highlight uh, is Relaxing with Resources. Uh, it is a program that was created specifically um, for our uh, daily users. Uh, that's a term I'm borrowing from Seattle Public Library uh, that they um, uh, had, had, had been using or have used uh, to refer to you know, their uh, customers or users that are temporarily uh, with housing, without housing or dealing with various forms of homelessness. And so um, in, in that vein, we created a program, Relaxing with Resources, that provided refreshments and things of that nature uh, to help, you know, kind of draw them in. But uh, we also wanted to then introduce them to the various uh, programs and services that the library had. And we also wanted to use that opportunity to learn more about what their specific needs are so that from there we could turn Relaxing with Resources into a more robust um, offering. And so um, in its current form, uh, we regularly have, um, you know, speakers 
um, or guests from various organizations within the Greensboro community, such as the Greensboro Housing Authority uh, and the local um, you know, division of the uh, urban ministries to come in and give um, you know, these, these clients different uh, tips and tools that can help you know, them combat or, or deal with various things that they're experiencing. And so one of the really key takeaways and things that we're most excited and enthused about with this program is that it is directly led to uh, several um, of our daily users uh, actually being able to secure um, housing. And if not for the relationship that that program's facilitator, um, Stacy Reed, uh, had, had cultivated both with those individual daily users as well as um, the local organizations, then those success stories, um, you know, would not uh, have occurred. Those moments where, you know, we were able to assist with someone getting housing through um, those visits uh, would not have occurred. And so that's just one example of, you know, nurturing a relationship and how it has helped to create a more resilient community. Um, I use this uh, example of Read Between the Rhymes as kind of a, a bad idea um, in terms of the execution of it um, because there was some overstep and this was earlier in my uh, career and maturation as a you know, library professional. And, um, but one of the re relationships that I leaned on heavily for this was the uh, internal marketing and communications department. Um, and, and they um, helped to develop a logo for this program. I had a personal relationship with one of the uh, DJs at a local radio station. And so I was able to use that network, uh, use that relationship as I stated earlier with the whole power mapping kind of activity. I was able to use that uh, to, you know, to help bring this into fruition. Um, the way in which I say I overstepped in this is that um, I had actually gone uh, to that uh, that contact at the radio station prior to discussing it with um, my, my library's marketing and communications department. And, and I have learned uh, throughout the course of my career that it is really best to have those uh, internal communications and conversations on the front end so that you can move in alignment um, with, with, with the organization and, and, and so that you're not going to the same well, because it could have been the case, it wasn't at the time, but it could have been the case that they themselves had already had a relationship with uh, the radio station. And that might have been a, a better um, way in which we could have, you know, uh, brought the, the program uh, to, into fruition. But the reason why I'm highlighting this, aside from the lessons learned from the experience, uh, is that it was, again, one of those examples where leveraging the relationships with acquaintances um, allowed for us to uh, better serve, uh, even if only for a um, abbreviated time, uh, it allowed for us to better serve and better connect with some of our younger uh, library users and, and, and those reluctant readers um, within you know, that community. A third example I'll share, which I kind of uh, referenced earlier as well, was uh, the Bus Stop Bookshare Program uh, through Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. Uh, we had an existing relationship with CMS, the Charlotte Mecklenburg School System, um, and this uh, initiative uh, was something that, you know, I had kind of thought about and discussed with uh, some of my, some of the members of, of the team that I was uh, charged with leading, um, and, you know, they agreed that it was worth uh, taking a shot at it. And so uh, following, you know, that uh, experience of building consensus and and, and uh, support within my local, you know, or excuse me, within my immediate team, I then reached out to uh, members of the library's outreach department, uh, as well as the library's director at the time, and got their support and approval. Um, I shared with them this letter, which you see uh, present on the screen, uh, and gave them the opportunity uh, and asked uh, for their insight and input and how to best craft and frame the message. Um, and then, last but not least, obviously we formed uh, or, or leveraged the existing relationship and growing relationship that we had with the Charlotte Mecklenburg School System uh, and uh, another organization, Communities in Schools, uh, to be able to have them uh, issue or, or, or deliver uh, this library to the select book stop, bus stops that we were visiting so that those parents were made aware of uh, of the, the visits prior to their happening so that I just didn't show up uh, at the bus stop 
uh, as an odd or strange, uh, you know, man trying to talk with them about the library. And so we already had kind of an introduction. And so this kind of, to me, speaks to, um, and I hope with you resonates in some meaningful way as a as an example of what nurturing the relationships look like. Um, I did not start from scratch and say, hey, let's go and find um, another organization that can assist us, um, you know, within maybe neighborhoods. Uh, maybe I could have gone to a homeowner's association and said, hey, you know, we want to go to bus stops and such, but we didn't have, or at least I wasn't aware of uh, an active relationship that we had had with, you know, such an organization. And so Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools uh, being uh, already an existing partner made a lot of sense, um, you know, and then again with the nurturing piece, um, having those conversations both internally um, with my immediate team, with the outreach department, with um, you know, the director himself, uh, having those conversations, that's, that's nurturing, um, you know, uh, being um, transparent, being willing to sh share your ideas um, in a respectful and, and, you know, professional way, um, and being able to show, you know, the synergy uh, with existing initiatives, right? So, you know, had I come to the outreach department or even the director with this idea at a time when, you know, maybe our relationship with the school system was suffering, then maybe it would not have been as well received as it was. And so timing uh, is key uh, and being cognizant, again, of the need to nurture the relationships and be strategic uh, in, in, your, um, in your approach and in your service uh, to, to the community. Another example that I'll share uh, from uh, Greensboro Public Library, the institution where I'm currently uh, serving as the deputy director, is uh, a seat at the table. These are conversations that we have with the community um, where we essentially communicate to them that we are listening. We want to learn from them about their ideas, their aspirations for the community uh, in an effort to, again, nurture relationships, um, but also tailor our programs and services you know, to them. Um, and to their, their needs and interests. And so um, this was a, a program that we began um, back in 2018 um, and have, you know, recently launched uh, a, a, another tour or, or version of it um, as it will do two things, uh, we hope. One, it will uh, support the city manager's efforts here in the city of Greensboro of ensuring that all city departments are data informed, purpose-driven, and people-centered. Um, but it will also help us with our own um, strategic plan for the library because the feedback that we use will also, or excuse me, the feedback that we receive and in the, in the conversations that we have uh, with the community will give us, um, you know, a really good pulse um, or sense of the pulse and the heartbeat of the community and those goals that they have both as individuals and the collective goals that they have um, so that we can support them, even if that support is only through information referrals to other agencies. Um, you know, we want to, to position ourselves as being able to, you know, support. Um, and the last example that I'll share, also here from the Greensboro Public Library, um, I previously referenced the Beyond Customer Service mantra or model, and uh, one of the initiatives that has spawned or uh, branched off from that uh, customer service uh, program is a swap and survey initiative um, that does two things for us. It provides cross-training opportunity uh, for, for public service staff um, as they're able to, you know, go to one uh, location and, and, you know, help ensure that we are providing consistent services across the branch. Um, and, and, you know, kind of a latent function of that, obviously, is that we're nurturing the relationships that they have internally with one another. Um, because if you know that uh, they're doing, um, you know, if you know at one location they have one brand or, or method of doing something um, and you can, you know, um, learn or glean something from them that might help us become more consistent and, and efficient across locations, uh, then that's a good thing. Um, and then the other uh, benefit of these swapping surveys, obviously, is that we hear from community members because in addition to swapping locations, uh, those staff members who participate in this um, are also um, charged with surveying customers. And so on the front end, we've given them, um, you know, a lot of training and, and resources and tools for how they can facilitate conversations uh, with, with customers, excuse me, um, and, and they provide, or excuse me, they ask questions with these customers about their experiences 
as they are, you know, exiting um, the facilities. And it kind of provides, uh, because it's someone from another location, in most instances, it gives, um, in some ways, the customers um, a little bit more, I guess, freedom um, to be able to speak candidly about their experiences, whether it's, you know, from that day or from a previous um, day. And so we use that information um, to, again, perfect our services, but also to influence um, and help ensure that our strategic plan is responding um, to, the, to the reflections and to the, the, the feedback we're receiving from uh, our users. And so, uh, with it being 9.50 and us having uh, approximately 10 minutes left, uh, I want to, uh, again, thank you all for this opportunity to kind of kick off uh, the second day of the, of the conference. Um, I hope that you've gleaned uh, some things from this. Uh, my email address uh, or my every library contact uh, is, is present. Um, and I, you know, uh, because I'm relational in nature, as I said, I, you know, am certainly open to uh, continuing the conversation offline with any of you who wish to, you know, reach out. But if there are any questions at this time, I'm happy to hear and hopefully address them. open the floor for questions, please type them in the chat area if you do have any questions. Brian will give everyone a second to type. Absolutely, absolutely. Here's one. What are your recommended methods for getting buy-in from staff? Um, so I, I believe um, in inclusion and collaboration. Um, again, I feel like I've said it um, so many times here this morning, but uh, nurturing relationships is really important. And I think the way that you do that with staff is very similar to how you do it with customers. Is you you know you ask questions so that you can learn about their perspective and even their preferences. Make them a part of the process. People are typically, and and again I say people because staff and customers alike. Um, are are more likely to um, buy in and to own um, a project or an initiative um, if they can see themselves in it. And so um, as a part of Beyond, what we actually have is a team of it Beyond Ambassadors. Um, that's, that's what we call, and those are the individuals, those are the staff members who facilitate uh, or who participate in those swapping surveys and perform, you know, those, you know, surveys with, with our, you know, customers. Um, and we had had regular kind of meetups and check-ins with them where, you know, in addition to, um, you know, giving them some strategies and tips for how they can best facilitate those one-on-one -on -one conversations, we've also uh, given them the opportunity to um, directly um, comment on and help curate or shape the training um, that we have also developed the customer service or public service training that we've also developed um, around that Beyond initiative. And so they um, were basically the, the first adopters. They were the test group. They received the training. And then they were also given, um, they were also given uh, the opportunity, um, you know, to give feedback about the training. And in many instances, some of the feedback that they provided, um, you know, those changes were made right there within that classroom um, or training session. Um, because we thought, um, you know, it necessary for them to really know that we were really um, valuing their input and feedback. And so um, I was telling the presenters uh, or the host uh, of this conference that I get a little long-winded when I get nervous and passionate about things. And so um, I hope that answers that question. But again, ins ensuring buy-in for me is all about making sure that people can see themselves in the initiative or the project in any way that you're able to do that. Um, another key element of this, uh, of that, and then I'll uh, stop with this answer is is communication. Um, it's communication, and so uh, prior before or as a part of the launch, um, and prior to the launch, I would really consider being prior to the launch of the Beyond program. We um, sent a, a letter uh, that was, you know, signed. 
um, by members of our library administration, myself and our director, Bridget Blanton, to each of the Beyond Ambassadors who we were selecting to participate in this program so that they, um, you know, on the front end knew the role and the responsibility that they would have as ambassadors uh, for the program. And so, yeah, I'll stop there. Communication is key. Brian, we have a lot of really um, good questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to them all, but we do have five minutes. Okay. Um, so here's one. Regarding the We're Listening program, how did the library show that it did, in fact, listen? Were there follow-up contacts with in individuals or some other method of acknowledgement? Yes. Um, yes is the short answer. Um, I'll expound on that, obviously. <laughs> um, so in, in many instances, um, some of the locations, um, because the managers and the staff at those locations who were holding those, you know, we're listening, which, is, which are now being referred to as seat at the table uh, conversations or sessions, they opted to um, hold host multiple um, occurrences of, of these programs. And so what they would do is they would tailor um, some of those events to specific demographics or audiences. And so they might have one session or event that was exclusively for teens, um, and they would advertise it as such, or they might have one that was exclusively for a senior population. Um, and they also would have some, um, in many instances, that were just for everyone as a way to kind of foster some, you know, intergenerational uh, communication and collaboration within our community. But um, specifically at one of the ones uh, that was um, geared towards seniors, um, the seniors talked about two things. Um, this was at our Kathleen Clay Edwards uh, family branch, if you want to visit our website and learn more about that particular location. Um, but they, they had two things that they were interested in, they being the senior uh, population who attended that. They wanted to um, one, learn more about the things that they could do recreationally um, to make the best use of their their time, um, and, and 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 you know get the most out of you know their active years um, and retirement years. And um, the other thing that they wanted um, that that rose to the top um, in some of the discussions that they were having was they wanted to be able to contribute. Right. And that's not uncommon. Right. Because, you know, some of our best and most trusted volunteers, not only in our library, but in other library systems where I work and I'm sure in your libraries, some of the most trusted volunteers are, you know, our, our elder uh, members of the community um, because they're reliable, they're dependable, they have the, the flexibility within their schedules. And so anyway, one of the events or programs that was directly um, developed because of the, that feedback was a, a program uh, they call co coffee and conversations where members of the community, um, regular users, um, host those programs and they facilitate uh, those programs. There's an adult services librarian at that location whom they work with, um, you know, and, and, and can share their materials with in advance of the program, but they host those programs. So if they, if, if there's a member of the community who has um, a real strong um, you know, golf uh, background, and he wants to share, uh, or she wants to share, you know, that expertise or that love of golf with their, um, you know, with their friends or members of the community, they do that. And uh, they put together whole presentations and, you know, that uh, librarian has helped them with that, um, with, with, you know, development of that program. And there's been a lot of others, a lot of others that have emerged from that. Um, the, the, the Relaxing with Resources was actually uh, kind of a, uh, developed as a result of feedback we received uh, because one at one session, um, an attendee, a participant at one of the relisting the sessions back in 2018 said, hey, we want to, uh, you know, give the members of our community who are dealing with various forms of homelessness, we want to give them um, the opportunity to, um, you know, reclaim, uh, some of their dignity, right? They're members of our community is just as much as anyone else. And so how, how might we go about doing that? Um, and they had even gone so far as to say, uh, they being the, the, the attendees at that program had gone so far as to say, hey, we can, you know, let them lead programs or let them use story times or, or what have you. And we haven't necessarily 
going that far just yet. We haven't taken that risk. But one of the things that we decided and determined that we needed to do after reflecting on that conversation that we had with that we're listening participant is that we needed to do a better job and be more intentional in forming relationships with our daily users, with those members who were dealing with various forms of homelessness so that we could learn about their interests and so that we could um, potentially tap them at some point to help direct or steer uh, some of our programs kind of as, you know, peer, uh, you know, advocates, uh, which is one of the models that a lot of, um, you know, we talk about health and, and, and uh, social work or trauma-informed um, service. That's a model that a lot of uh, libraries are using now as this peer, uh, you know, this, this kind of peer-driven um, brand of service to that population or community. And so us becoming more intentional in our efforts to, to get to know them was a direct um, result of information and conversations that had or happened at that listening session. Thank you so much, Brian. I am so sorry that we couldn't get to all of your questions, but it's time. And again, thank you, Brian, for being here today. And thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to contact your State Library's Continuing Education Coordinator. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that with your feedback. Um, thanks all, and be sure to join us at 1030 for the next concurrent sessions, Building Resilience with Bibliotherapy and Services to Special Populations. Thank you so much. Thank you.